So, you know, of course, the, uh, um, I forgot my glasses. So if I lose the debate, it's because I really can't see what I'm supposed to be saying from the slides. That's my disclaimer. The uh, truth of the matter is it's uh, fortunate to go second so I can actually have uh, comments to make about my colleague's talk, which was a wonderful talk, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak here and I thank the organizers. Um, so will novel agent combination therapy become the standard of care for CLL? Um, here are my disclosures, and the answer is no, and it really is best for us to continue forward using our agents in a sequential manner. And I just wanted to bring up some general points that, you know, clearly if my, my colleague is spending so much time arguing what I'm going to say, he must know that I have a better argument and therefore I should win. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on adverse events. And Adverse events are certainly very important from our perspective because if we can't keep our patients on the therapy, they can't benefit. But I could tell you that if you're having trouble with ibrutinib as a single agent, you're certainly going to have trouble with ibrutinib in combination. And so all of a sudden there, that whole argument has to be ignored. Third, and what's most important to the patient, isn't how quickly they get into deep remission or um, how deep the remission is, but really how long the remission lasts. So PFS is what matters to the patient. And I really want everyone to keep that in mind, regardless, not just for this debate, but in all going forward, because that's really what is most important to the patient. Giving patients FCR chemotherapy, we can get an MRD level of 60%, you know, at four months of therapy. But the truth is, is that's not what's best for them long term. And so it's very important to remember that how quick you get into remission or how deep your remission is is not nearly as important as how long that remission lasts. Uh, finally, the, uh, you know, the issue really becomes as we start combining these new agents or these old agents with new agents, you know, there's still a huge amount of accumulative toxicity that really becomes an issue. And so I'd like to point out a couple of issues. One is, you know, fludarabine by itself has a risk of MDS AML estimated to be at about 2%. FCR is up to 8%. So here was a bright idea of combining fludarabine and cyclophosphamide to dramatically diminish um, the CLL burden and get deep, deep responses that really resulted in a marked increase in secondary AML. And so that certainly is something to keep in mind. Second, I'd like to remind everyone of a clinical trial that was done looking at idelosib in combination with GS9973, which was a, is a SICK inhibitor. So we combined a PI3 kinase inhibitor with a SICK inhibitor and had a very unexpected finding in that the first four patients all actually had uh, life-threatening uh, respiratory distress and probably a pneumonitis leading to significant morbidity and mortality. So combinations really do have not just a synergy in terms of efficacy, but a synergy in terms of toxicity. So let's go on and talk about our, our different possibilities for sequential therapy. And what I'm showing you here is really borrowed from Michael Halleck. So there's really three general treatment strategies. The first one is simultaneously combining therapies. And that, uh, Dr. Davids just sort of argued, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. And then two sequential mechanisms. One is sequential monotherapies to progression, and so that's taking a patient, treating them until they progress, and then moving on to the next agent. And then the third is actually what I'm calling tailored uh, treatment to tumor load. And basically, it's starting with the therapy to achieve a benefit, and then once that benefit is achieved, you then can switch to another therapy that might not have been optimally used because of issues related to the tumor load. And the example for this most notably is going to be venetoclax. So very dangerous risk of tumor lysis. That risk is probably enhanced by combining it with ibrutinib as the cells are pushed out of the lymph nodes into the blood, which we know is an absolutely um, difficult and high risk um, or a markedly increased risk for tumor lysis when you actually um, then administer venetoclax. So here you would use something like a brutinib 
lower the tumor risk, lower the tumor burden, reducing the tumor lysis risk, and then you can actually come in with venetoclax as a sequential agent. So talking about the sort of the risks and benefits of each of them. So as you can see here, the advantages that really go on for the uh, simultaneous treatment strategy, of course, is that you really avoid um, the risk of, of, I'm sorry, of developing resistance because you have mechanisms of actions that would be different and you would end up with the ability to hopefully knock out those cells that might actually survive from one agent with a second agent. But the disadvantage, as you can see, are really going to be related to, and I apologize, in my, this is where the vision becomes a problem, um, basically an increased risk of toxicities because all of a sudden now you have two agents that can be not just additive but also synergistic with their toxicities. Um, there's also the issue with um, these additional agents, sort of the question about you don't know which one is causing the toxicities. So you run into a scenario that all of a sudden a patient who has trouble on two agents losing out on both those agents and not one agent. So you don't know which agent's responsible for the adverse event. Talking about sequential therapies, um, here once again, as I mentioned, you're doing this to progression. So this is sequential monotherapies to progression to differentiate from the other idea. And the advantages here is that you really get to maximize the effectiveness of each individual agent. So you're going to keep taking the agent and get rid of as much of the disease that's sensitive. And one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, we currently watch and wait patients when they progress. But if we were to start patients who have progressed earlier on therapy, once they actually demonstrate some progression, and with this model, that's sort of what you would do, you're in a situation where you're actually avoiding having patients develop a huge tumor burden and the huge amount of genomic diversity that might lead to subsequent resistance. So in theory, each subsequent treatment could result in a higher overall response rate. And this actually allows drugs to be held in reserve for when they're needed next. And it allows you to actually really focus on prolonging that PFS, which really is the most important thing. And then once again, when you're dealing with adverse events, you know that the drug that's causing the adverse event is the one drug they're on. And so it helps guide your choice of the second drug or the next drug to use in order to maintain that patient. And the truth is, is one drug is always going to be better able to be tolerated than two drugs. And then finally, the issue becomes cost. And I'm not going to argue cost because, um, you know, who knows what the cost of all these agents are. But um, that's something that I think is actually in the bellywick of our politicians and not us as physicians. And then the final strategy is actually time, um, basically it's tailored treatment to tumor load, TTT. And basically the idea is the first is debulking and then comes basically the second round which is um, induction and then the third round is maintenance. And what's really nice about this is it allows you to choose the therapies that are going to be best suited for each individual aspect of it. So you worry about tumor lysis but you have an agent that generates a very deep remission like venetoclax. This allows you to choose another drug to actually remove the tumor load to the point where all of a sudden you can use the venetoclax safely. And it can be ibrutinib as we've done in the 1142 pharmacyclic study, or it can be obinutuzumab in the Genentech study that was earlier mentioned as well. So there's a lot of different options for combining drugs in this sequential manner. Um, of course, the one disadvantage to this is the same as the disadvantages to the earlier um, strategy where you once again can develop resistance to one agent and so we have to contend with that but once again as you move from agent to agent you know developing resistance on one agent doesn't indicate resistance to the next agent and I'll show you some data for that in a moment really suggesting that all these patients can be salvaged. So here are our novel agents for use. Currently approved we have ibrutinib, idelisa, venetoclax, and abinutuzumab. And we very shortly will have a very much expanded list that will include Develisib, Umbralisib, Vecabrutinib, Loxo 305, 
uh, AZ5991, and on and on and on. So it's important to remember that as these drugs have different mechanisms of action, once again, there will always be something else to offer our patients should they progress on one of these current agent regimens. So let me start by looking at the treatment-naive population from the, 11, from the Ibrutinib um, 1102 study. And what I really want to focus, the reason why I want to focus on the treatment-naive population is because I really do believe that the chemotherapy administered first generates all sorts of secondary hits and damage to the DNA that makes these cells more resistant. And we know that deletion 17P is an important predictor of your ability to respond to ibrutinib. And 17P is about 3 to 5 percent of people at diagnosis, patients at diagnosis. And all of a sudden, it can get up to 40 to 45 percent if we look at relapse refractory CLL, like what we saw in the IDEL and ibrutinib pivotal studies. So avoiding chemotherapy is an important part of enabling single-agent ibrutinib to be much more effective. So now we're dealing with what, in essence, is a population of patients that you can see there that has a PFS of 92% at five years. So for 92% of the population, single-agent ibrutinib is all they need. 8% will need something else. And these 8% will, and by the way, these 8% does include one patient who had a Richter's transformation. And so, of course, a combination with another novel agent or a combination with another CLL therapy would not have mattered. But it does include one patient who did develop progression uh, due to their CLL. So coming through with another agent afterwards will actually only really be necessary for 8% of the population. And what's important about all this is when we talk about tolerability and maintaining the patients on the drugs, you could see here with ibrutinib that the longer you're on the drug, the fewer the advance, adverse events are. And that's certainly a little disingenuous because, of course, the people who are having the adverse events are coming off early. But what I really want to emphasize from this and what's important to take home from this is that the adverse events are not cumulative, with one exception, and that's the hypertension. There does seem to be a continual increase in um, hypertension reported, and there's not a plateau on it as of now. But most of the patients are able to handle the hypertension without any issues. So we know that leaving patients on ibrutinib long term is not going to be a problem from an adverse event perspective, and most importantly, from an infection perspective. So we see fewer infections in our patients years two to compare to year one, and year three compared to year two. And so we're not creating these XLA kids. We're not creating, you know, basically immunopelagic patients. And so they're tolerating the long-term ibrutinib very nicely. And for those patients who do progress on ibrutinib, we actually have excellent other therapies. Currently, venetoclax is one that we've been studying a great deal in this population. And you can see that the you know, after a short, relatively short follow-up of 11.8 months, that the median duration of response, PFS, and overall survival have not been reached. And a 12-month PFS for all patients, including the relapse refractory patients, is really estimated to be at 80%. And once again, venetoclax post ibrutinib is very safe. No clinical tumor lysis was observed, and these certainly were patients who um, were receiving single-agent venetoclax probably a little bit earlier than what most watch and wait patients would have been at if we were treating them up front. Um, but there was just one case of tumor lysis that was laboratory significant in a patient with high tumor load. So the venetoclax is clearly effective and well tolerated as a second agent. So it's clear that we can really rescue these patients. So, Sequential therapy is the correct choice. It really enhances the overall survival and the tolerability of these agents, and that really is what's most important. And it really allows for clarification of the offending agents. So when we have so many agents to choose from, this really provides us with the opportunity to pick and move on and not run out of choices and to really preserve the quality of life of our patients. Thank you.